Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Adam Richardson. Hi Adam. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's great to have you on the show. Just a little introduction. Adam is a California police detective and host of the weekly Writers Detective Bureau podcast, where he answers questions about criminal investigation and police work posed by crime fiction authors and screenwriters, which and I know everyone's super excited to have you on the show. Um, but just start by telling us a bit more about your career in law enforcement and also why you wanted to help writers, because I'm sure you're busy enough. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely am. Um, so I've been a cop for the last 23 years or so, and 17 of those were spent as a detective. Um, everything from property crimes, like working burglary and fraud, to homicide, sexual assault, and robbery. And then after some, um, you know, being emotionally uh, wrenched out after working all the sexual assault crimes, then I went to narcotics, started having fun again, and then into a vice intelligence unit that I spent over a decade in and really loved. Um, and then I'm also a college faculty member. And mm -hmm. so by being a teacher as well as a cop, um, when my friends here in Southern California that do screenwriting you know, ask a few questions. It was a little bit of an aha moment to, you know, do this as a little side project and try to help as many writers as I can. Yeah, which is fantastic. And I know lots of people have questions and I've been listening to your show, um, the Writer's Detective Bureau <laughs> podcast. And I highly recommend people go over there because you answer lots of different questions in detail. So we're going to try and get a few questions in um, today. I just wanted to direct people over there for a lot more detail. But let's start um, by what are the things that annoy you most, the common things that people or authors particularly get wrong about police work and and criminal investigation? So, well, there are a few things, um, but I want to start with what writers get right. Um, writers are phenomenal about observing human behavior. Um, most people are so busy, you know, trying to project their own image and they're so in their head about what they're putting out there. I think especially the more introverted writers are really good about observing human behavior. Um, they are constantly writing and they're obsessed with the story um, at hand. And the reason why I think those are great things is because it actually translates really well into what we do as detectives. So I, I see a, very, a lot of similarity between writers and uh, detectives. So I think at the very least, that paves a great you know parallel between the two. So the things that writers do that are kind of... I don't want to say they get them wrong so much as it is they fall into the trap of a trope that, you know, we see time and time again. And so we just assume that they're the truth, um, like the maverick that breaks all the rules, you know, to get the job done. It's like a great detective or a great cop is somebody who plays by the rules. I mean, literally law enforcement mean enforcing the rules. So mm -hmm. to be great at that job, you have to be able to play by the rules, um, which goes right to search warrants writers, you know, it's always like, is this a favor that they have to ask a judge? Or is this something we just, you know, it slows down the process in the story to have them go seek a warrant. I mean, if you don't get a warrant, you're going to lose that court case later on. You're not going to be able to prove it because you violated that person's rights. There are some great ways to convey that in a story um, that are pretty realistic that are not going to bog down the storyline. I mean, mm. being a great detective means knocking out search warrants day in and day out. You can even do it over the phone, like a three-way phone call with a judge, a district attorney, and your detective. You lay out the story and you can go forth and conquer. That's Those small details are the things that will turn off people that are real big fans of the genre. Um but it's it's not you shouldn't view it as a uh, a big slog or a bottleneck to the story because you can just pay a little bit of lip service and keep going. Um, interrogations, the interrogation scene, especially in episodic television, isn't about actually doing an interrogation so much as it is a whole bunch of exposition that the protagonist gives of <laughs> these are all the things that we figured out. And so I'm summing it up for the audience because I hope you were following along and didn't come back from a bathroom break too late. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so to, to excel with an interrogation scene, which we'll probably talk about a little later is um, understanding the why of everybody that's in that room, not just mm -hmm. the detective, but then also the suspect um, or the attorney or whatever. Um, and then finally, my 
last pet peeve is the rank of your characters. We all have this tendency to want to have our hero be the most important person. So they're the detective sergeant this or the detective lieutenant that or across, you know, in the UK, especially um, DS so-and-so or DCI so-and-so, you know, like a detective sergeant or detective chief inspector. Those are supervisory, uh, supervisory positions. Mm -hmm. So like if you're a detective sergeant, your real job is you're running a group of somewhere between three and seven detectives. You're approving overtime. You're obviously you are um, honestly kind of in charge over to a certain extent the investigation. But it's really the detective that is one that's responsible and the, and the one doing all the legwork. Um, when we're talking about a detective lieutenant or a DCI, I mean, they're almost middle management. You know, if you picture somebody with the obsessed about the overtime stats, you know, and, and spreadsheets, that is a lot of time, um, the reality of their day to day job, they may actually be the ranking person in the unit. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of their work is going to be administrative, not necessarily the ones that are actually in the interview rooms or at the crime scenes. Um, for major crimes, they will go to the crime scenes, but they aren't necessarily the ones doing all of the work. Um, so with all of that said, these details I know make it seem really, really daunting for a writer because to write fiction, the great thing about fiction is you can make up everything, uh, you know, but then it's like when you start talking about crime fiction, there's this other set of rules that are pretty foreign potentially um, and you don't want to let down an audience so a lot of people are really reluctant to get into the genre but if there's anything you take away from this episode of the podcast it's that there's a support network out there of cops and lawyers and other writers and cops turn writers we we want to see you succeed and we're out there to, to really help you and to do it for free yeah, and it's so funny you say that because I did a, a day at the FBI in New York oh, wow. as part of Thriller Fest, and they were so great. I mean, there were a few stereotypes there, obviously, <laughs> the sure. guys in the suits and stuff, but it was lovely because they said the same thing. They were like, we really want you writers to write the best, most correct type of story possible, so we really want to help, um, so do ask. But I do, I want to come back on you also on the police procedural thing because I, I thought I was going to write crime thrillers and I wrote one um, desecration and then I realized that police procedural is super hard um, because of all these reasons so I then had my um, detective leave and become a private investigator because mm -hmm. of the maverick trope I wanted her to be a rebel so is uh, what's the truth I guess between a private investigator and a cop I mean obviously one is not employed by 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 the law but you know where's the line Right. So that's actually quite common. And a lot of times it's because the writer is investigating that whole field, that whole career alongside their private investigator protagonist. Um, many real PIs are former cops. Um, there are a lot that aren't, uh, but it is it's similar in the sense that they're working in investigation. And simply put, uh, there's a lot of in a former life, or not former life, former assignment, I worked uh, in intelligence work. And so a lot of the time it was, well, what's the, what is intelligence? Or what is, everyone knows what an investigation is. So first is understanding what your goal is. And this goes back to the private eye thing as well as the police thing. An investigation is we're standing here on our timeline and I'm looking backward into the past and trying to figure out what happened. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at the evidence. I'm um, talking to witnesses. I'm piecing together this puzzle of what happened in the past. That's really all that I'm doing. And I'm plotting it on a timeline. Um, and intelligence is the exact same thing, only we're looking at the future. We're looking at evidence. We're looking at what people saw, all of those things to try to predict what's going to happen. So it's really the difference on the timeline of which way you're facing. Mm. As a private investigator, you're doing the same thing, but it is for a client as opposed to the police. So it may be the client might be a spouse who thinks that their partner is cheating, um, which is pretty common, or it could be a defense attorney that is hiring essentially the equivalent of a law enforcement detective to try to find evidence to exonerate their client. Mm -hmm. So um, I mean, it's the same concept of looking backward on a timeline and piecing things together. It's just who you're doing it for. 
Mm, no, that's fantastic. And um, just coming back to the kind of trope of the cop character. So we've had the mm -hmm. maverick, and of course you you worked in narcotics, and everyone's got the trope of the the bad narcotics cop with the drugs mm -hmm. in the boot of the car, taking all the money from the drug kingpin, whatever. Another right. trope. Um, so what are how do we make our cop characters um more ri richer and more three dimensional, um, without making them alcoholics or or dirty cops. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, alcoholism, PTSD, divorce, uh, blown out vertebrae. I, I like to think that you're a rookie until you have one of these. Uh, two wait, of them wait, make wait. you a detective. What, what is the blown out vertebrae? Where does that come from? Oh, so we wear those big, heavy gun belts. And so if you wear that for 30 years, you're going to end up with some sort of spinal damage or you're wearing a helmet or something. So oh, no, bad that's backs, awful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So bad backs, divorce, PTSD and alcoholism. Um, you're a rookie until you have at least one. Uh, you're a detective if you have two. Three makes you a veteran and then four is a cliche. So um, <laughs> you I, I really I mean, I guess what it comes down to is that in reality, cops come in all shapes and sizes, um, ethnicities, gender identities, they're, they're real people. Um, and we all have different strengths and interests and personalities. And the trope tends to be, you know, to use like a, um, a sports thing, our heroes want to be the captain of the team, but in reality, all of those positions on the team need to be played. So the way to write more rich characters would be to um, just as a writing exercise, like wherever you are right now listening to this podcast, if you're sitting across from you on a, a bus or a train right now, or you're in a coffee shop or stuck in traffic and the next car over, look at the person nearest you and start thinking about who, what kind of cop would they be? You know, what, what assignment based on just the broad strokes that you're, and not stereotyping, but just, you know, this person could never be a cop. Or, or could they be the most effective cop you've ever seen because you don't assume that they're a cop? Um, so then start thinking about what kind of assignment would they work? Um, do they like their job and are they good at it? What makes them good at it? Or if they don't like their job or they don't, um, they're not necessarily excelling, what other position could you move them to? And so that's where the conflict would come of, um, you know, finding that perfect fit. So for me, like where I was talking about how I spent a decade in um, one specific position, it was after three or four different detective assignments where it was like, I found what I love to do. Mm. So, you know, the if you're really into science, um, you're obviously going to have a, a better time in, in your left brain thinker and your analytical and you may have some more of the um, you know, real detail oriented tendencies, you may not excel in a detective role as a narcotics officer because you're constantly on the run. You're dealing with, you know, nasty uh, scenes, you know, because drug users and drug dealers tend not to live in the nicest um, communities or at least uh, have the best housekeeping tendencies. Um, but you may be great as somebody in forensics or somebody that is working financial crimes where you're literally doing, um, you know, accounting and uh, uh, forensic auditing. So if you were to think about the types of people that would excel at these different positions, you can create, you know, pretty rich characters, um, but then challenge yourself. Don't fall for the trope. Think of what would be the most outlandish or the most you know, hmm, that's kind of interesting kind of position. And then, you know, just take take the people around you that you observe and, and plop them down into a police career and see see where that, that uh, little writing exercise takes you. And it's funny, as you were talking there, I thought, okay, so who's done that? And then I thought Link, Lincoln Rhyme by Jeffrey Deaver is a black quadriplegic <laughs> cop. I mean, I don't know awesome. if Jeffrey just did that, like you said, and went, oh, what, who is the least likely person to to be a cop? And of course, he's a brilliant cop. Um, and um, yeah, so that's really interesting. Then I was thinking 
about the generational differences because um, as we discussed before this, you and I are about the same age, Generation X. um, So we didn't have the internet when we were growing up. Um, Cybercrime was not really something that was, you know, necessarily around 25 years ago. Um, But now you've got boomers who are presumably most senior people in the police force. And then you've got millennials who are coming in and younger people who are just brought up on tech. So what are some of the issues or some of the conflicts that might occur between a boomer character and a millennial character that that might manifest? Sure. So, well, in law enforcement, we tend to um, retire earlier just because we tend not to live as long working, you know, or at least I shouldn't say live as long. We don't live as long once uh, post retirement. But um, I mean, it is definitely a younger person's sport, if you will, uh, when it comes to being effective out on the street. Obviously, Mm -hmm. the higher up in rank where you're not, you know, in foot pursuits and that kind of stuff, it's easier to be a little on the older side. But um, at least in from what I've seen in California, being kind of in between the boomers and the millennials was um, one of the biggest defining moments was the Rodney King incident. And so when Rodney King happened, um, I was still in high school. And then when the trial and the riots happened, I was in college. And so I came out uh, of school and into law enforcement just as this big shift happened where it was not the old school. There was this expectation for a new type of policing, community oriented policing that was about getting out of your car and talking to people and making real connections, not just, you know, being the guy that showed up and, you know, beat somebody over the head with uh, a baton. So that, so I, I'm kind of like the in between, in between, um, group between the one extreme of, you know, the, the, old school cop that, you know, didn't have time to, you know, do any kind of peacemaking stuff. And then on the more younger side, because of not just Rodney King, but any, you know, Ferguson and all of the other um, things where the, the negative side of policing really came to light when it came to, you know, modern um, media and social media, we now have a generation of cops that are, um, well, first of all, I don't believe in the millennial stereotype. They are some of the hardest working people that I've I've seen. I, I mean, more so than a lot of the people that I've worked with my age and older. Um, but there is also, be, being so plugged in, there is also a concern about um, overstepping their bounds. So they may be less likely to uh, um, do what they need to do to end a situation. So that means, you know, they may be reliant upon the tech that's on their belt, like a taser or, you know, something that is going to solve the problem for them rather than actually being comfortable going hands on with the person and putting them in handcuffs. You know, if you don't get into an argument with person after, with a person after you've told them two or three times. After that, it's time to do your job, not continue to argue, and, you know, not get avoid the conflict, I guess. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the little things. But. I mean, there's definitely a disconnect between the two generations, but we're getting to the point now where those Gen X officers are now becoming the bosses and the baby boomers are enjoying retirement. And then, uh, I mean, there's still a few hanging on, but, um, (laughs) yeah. So, I mean, the millennials are definitely harder working. A lot of times they, uh, have more education, but then they also may be too much in their head to, um, put all the thinking aside and actually do what needs to get done. That is a very broad stroke and every person is different. So we have a lot of millennials that are coming back from the military that have seen atrocities that I've never seen. Mm. So yeah, I, I mean, it's another opportunity for you to create a great character um, and you know, kind of explore that and see what their take on the world is. Yeah, and well, I think I keep bringing it back to conflict because another kind of trope is the cop versus the the the, the criminal, whereas mm-hmm. actually there's a lot more layers of potential conflict even you know within law enforcement itself or even. Um, internal conflict which i think you know again the um the dirty cop taking the drug money is one thing but one thing else that millennials i think have brought into play as well is that 
they do think differently about some issues and presumably a lot of the laws that for example um and again this is not a political show but an example mm -hmm. of a law um say your immigration policy in your southern states uh where mm -hmm. law enforcement were doing things that some people didn't agree with <laughs> let's just phrase it like that um but sure. if a if a law enforcement officer does not agree with the law is that an internal conflict that they can ever resolve or do they just get on and do the job? Uh, or they decide not to do the job anymore. Um, mm. Find another agency to work for. It kind of goes back to the conversation before where we, where I was talking about finding the right fit, not, you know, where we were talking about a job assignment, but the same thing goes with your agency. Mm. Um, if you have a, um, I mean, I certainly have my own thoughts and opinions on what's going on at the border and, you know, the level of compassion that we're currently showing versus, you know, what I think should be done. Um, it's tough to say. And if you're right in the middle of it and it is something that is such an internal conflict, um, that will be the time where you either need to do something to change that at the, um, the operational level, or you need to remove yourself from it, like change something internally with you. Um, so yeah, there's constant internal conflict. Uh, crimes are broken down, to, not to throw some Latin out there, but uh, essentially crimes are either mala in se, which means they're, they're bad in just in their body, in the way that they are, or they're mala prohibita, which is they're, they're a crime because we said they're a crime. Mm -hmm. So like marijuana possession. Yes. There's nothing inherently evil about possessing marijuana. It's just we decided that that's something that we want to write a law about or not write a law about. Mm -hmm. And so, or remove the law, um, versus something where we would all agree that murder or taking something that belongs to somebody else, that is, uh, um, just inherently wrong. And so if you are in a position where you're having to enforce a law that you may not agree with, um, it's more often a mala prohibita crime than it is something that is a mala in say crime. Um, in, in most of the stories that we're drawn to tend to be ones that are more on that mala and say that visceral feeling of, is there a moral worth to the story that we're embarking on? And it could be that you're trying to right the wrongs from within the agency, um, which is definitely a David and Goliath battle. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it, internal conflict is real. I'm, I mean, and obviously law enforcement, like crime fiction it is, I mean, when you go to a courtroom, it is the people of the state of California against so-and-so. Just in the title itself, it is conflict, and conflict drives story. So that's the reason why it is such a popular thing, for sure. Um, but anytime you explore something on a deeper level, like with that internal conflict, um, you know, what's the right thing to do, and why did the character take that path, I think that's really interesting. Mm. No, you're right. And I think this this conflict idea is so important. And, and again, as you say, why it's so popular a genre to read. I mean, in Britain, I mean, I think crime fiction is probably our number one genre. Um, and true crime in America, I think, is, is huge. I mean, it, it's just massive, these books. Um, but again, another layer of conflict and something I'm thinking about. Obviously, I'm in the UK. You're in the US. Um, I, I have been told at Thriller Fest, I always get people go, is it true that your cops don't carry guns? <laughs> and I'm like, well, most of them don't, you know, some of them do now, but it's, you know, there are these fundamental differences in jurisdictions. And you just mentioned marijuana. I was in Amsterdam last week and, you know, I mean, it, this is just, it's obviously... The, you just do that. Part it's of the not, culture. Yeah, it's part of the culture. It's not an issue. Um, it's not illegal, you know, whatever. So I have an idea. I've mentioned this before on the show, but um, or, on a boat, uh, some murders on a boat. I'm not going to get more detail than that. But you do have a really interesting episode on your podcast about um, murders on a boat. But I wondered if we could talk about international issues because it would seem to me in this kind of global world we're in where we can all fly around uh, the place what happens mm -hmm. when there's international murders either in international waters or between states where where um you have to negotiate with different people to get things done that is a great question so a lot of the laws that uh, or a lot of one thing a lot of writers don't necessarily realize is that Jurisdiction can often extend beyond the physical borders of the country. So, um, like, for instance, in the United States, we have federal laws that prohibit certain actions done by American citizens anywhere in the world. 
So like the the sex tourism where an American male goes over to, you know, the um, Asian Pacific and they start engaging in all sorts of vile, disgusting things, even though they may be in another country. The fact that they're an American citizen makes it a crime in American court. So obviously there has to be some sort of international um, working going on. Um, for the U.S., the FBI has a position that they call a legal attache, and they abbreviate it or they kind of shorten it as legat. So you can, as a special agent for the FBI, you can get assigned to London or you could get assigned to Thailand or whatever. And you're working out of um, a U.S. consulate or embassy, and your role is to liaise with the local law enforcement. So in that case, if you had, you know, an American citizen leave California or New York and go over to you know, like wherever, somewhere in the Asian Pacific and commit that crime, an FBI agent would be involved in getting you arrested locally there and then extradited back to the United States. Mm. Um, the other time that we will see that uh, on the international scale using the FBI at the local level, uh, since I'm a local detective, not an FBI agent, is if I have a murder here in California, and I think that that um, suspect fled overseas somewhere, I will, even though it's just a state crime of murder, I will go to the FBI and they will write a warrant, an arrest warrant that's international called an unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. Um, so they will take that um, unlawful flight warrant and essentially um, flag it in the Interpol system. So one thing to understand about Interpol, which um, is the International Criminal Police Organization, they're not like a police body that goes out and arrests people. Mm -hmm. um, they're kind of like the UN. Uh, they're headquartered in Lyon, France, but they um, kind of work to make a, um, I guess it's their, their bridging cooperation between police agencies from around the world. Um, and they try to do so as neutral as they can, like avoiding politics and all the other dipl uh, diplomatic stuff. So if you have, um, you know, a foreign country that needs access to somebody that's here, um, you try to bridge bridge those gaps using um, those kind of diplomatic ties at the police level as mm -hmm. opposed to the actual uh, diplomacy stuff. So yeah, it can be pretty interesting. And like for the UK, I would imagine that... Um, whether it's the Met or the National Crime Agency, um, somebody, I would imagine, has a similar program where they have uh, British law enforcement agents around the world to handle the police interests of the UK abroad. So it, I don't know that for sure, but that's certainly something that uh, writers could research to find out, you know, if you have this transnational or international kind of crime spree, who would really be the players involved? Mm, no, fantastic. And just coming back to the boat, um, aren't there, yeah. I, I, from my research, I understand that there are places on the high seas as such that are uh, not anyone's jurisdiction. So what, what would happen right. in, in that um, instance? So you would fall under the jurisdiction of where the ship was registered. So if you were on a, um, you know, an American cruise liner that's somewhere out in way out in the Pacific or way down, you know, way out in the Atlantic, um, you could potentially fall under the jurisdiction of whatever flag that that ship is sailing under, um, or it could be the national under, under the laws of either the nationality of the suspect or of the uh, victim. It, it really kind of depends. Um, but I would imagine that all of the potential legal uh, legal jurisdictions involved may end up getting together and kind of hashing it out as to where it's going to go. More often than not, when you have those kind of in-between scenarios, you're going to get more players involved rather than fewer players involved. Ah, okay. So that could be more painful as opposed to less painful. Right. Yeah, so, um, yeah, exactly. So like if you have a ship, like let's say you won the lottery and you have a ship and you decide you're not going to register your ship with any country, I'm not going to fly under a flag so that 
why I'm not beholden to these countries. The problem then becomes that any country that, you know, if you're in their waters <laughs> or near there, it's like, yeah, hey, you don't want hey that. we don't know who you are, so we can board you. Yeah, so you bring on more trouble than it's worth. <laughs> well, that, that's good to know. Um, and it's <laughs> funny because, of course, you know, I don't want to give away my ideas and, and everyone's got their ideas. But I, what I love about your podcast is you, you're, you're talking about things which can give you ideas. And this kind of reverse um, design is what you um, you talk about. So you help screenwriters. Now, I'm, I'm a discovery writer. So as in, I'm a pan I prefer mm-hmm. discovery writer. So I don't okay. tend to know necessarily um, what's going to happen. Like when I wrote that crime novel, Desecration, I didn't know actually who was going to do it. So, right. but obviously if you're helping screenwriters and to be fair, the best crime novels are highly plotted. Jeffrey Deaver, as mentioned, writes like 200 pages of plot before he writes his book. So um, how do you do this uh, this story timeline if you're advising writers' rooms on, on this plotting idea? So, well, first, I have nothing against pants or discovery writers. <laughs> um, it's a great way to uh, roll through your first draft to see where your creation is going to go. But ultimately, you're going to get stuck. You're going to get to a point where you've written yourself into a corner and you're like, oh, man, how how am I going to get out of this? And it's one of those things where this is one of the common scenarios where there is a, a, a script in process where a writer's room has all of these things that they want, these scenes that they want to have happen, but then they know how to get from A to B. And a lot of times it's a lot easier, kind of like when you're, when you were a kid and you were doing the maze puzzle, it's easier to start at the end and work your way back because the branches that go off in a million different directions don't look the same when you're in reverse. Um, so you're kind of reverse engineering the story of, so I will, I will start with what do you want the end to be? Do you want the bad guy to get away or do you want him to be caught? Okay. You want him to be caught, but not until this point. Okay. So we want it later in the story than what would normally happen in a typical investigation. So we need the interrogation scene to be one where he's not in jail or, or he's, you know, they don't know if he's done it yet. So reverse engineering the story, um, can be a smart way to, um, kind of make those logical leaps where you've, you've changed the mindset on how you're rolling through the story. Um, you, and I think we kind of underestimate the significance of working backward in our thinking. Um, this actually goes to the way we tell lies and try to cover them up. Um, one of the techniques that we'll use for, um, interview and interrogation is I'm going to ask you to tell me what happened, you know, start this morning, work all the way through until you came to the interview room right now. And you're going to tell me your story. A lot of it's going to be a lie. A lot of it's going to be the truth. It depends. Um, but when I ask you to then tell me that story again, but start now and work backward, your brain isn't thinking that way. And so if you're fabricating something, it's going to be really hard to get everything in order. But if you're recalling what you did in order of like, well, I was here and before that I was at my mom's house and before that, I, you know, it's easy to, to recall stuff. But if you're fabricating in reverse, your brain has a hard time wrapping yourself, your, the process that way. Mm-hmm. So similarly, if you're trying to create the story backward when you're, I mean, you're not sitting in an interview room with a cop asking you, you know, all of these questions, but it gives your brain the chance to stop and reset and think about, mm, okay, what order did this happen? And where, you know, do these little threads go? So that's just one of the techniques. Mm. Yeah, it's so it's so interesting, because I think the the plotting the threads. Um, so when you talk about timelines, I mean, every, again, in everyone's mind, there's the whiteboard in the, you know, at the at the police station with the kind of right. the lines on it and the pictures and things. Is, is that how you do it? Or, you know, what, how would you recommend doing that? Well, I've never been issued a roll of yarn to plot out. <laughs> Why <my> not? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no. So, the, yes, we do. Um, I will have a dry erase board. Like, I'll occupy a conference room 
or we've got dry, dry erase boards on the wall. And as we encounter new witnesses or suspects or people, those pictures will go up there. But really, and this is the importance of creating an omniscient timeline as a writer for yeah. everything. And what I mean by omniscient timeline is knowing where um, all of your characters were at what time and what they were doing, where they were, and when those timelines intersect, that's where you're going to have your inciting incident or your interrogation. That's where the things, the conflicts happen, is when those timelines weave. The, but the reason why a timeline is so important is because that is the true why of your detective. So when I'm going into, like when we first talked about uh, investigations, I'm looking down that timeline into the past of trying to plot out when did this happen? When did that happen? Um, and that's where I'm piecing together the truth. So when I go into that interrogation, um, it's again, it's not exposition. It's I'm trying to lock my suspect into a story. He may lie to me. He may tell me the truth. He may do both in the interview. But whatever he says, that's memorialized on that timeline of you said you were here and now regardless of whether or not it's true or not i'm going to see whether that's true i'm going to find other ways to determine if you told me the truth for this and if it looks like you're a liar that's not going to play out well for the jury now this is where you can as a writer can create red herrings where if i'm in this interview um and i'm interviewing a witness and i'm getting this lie and i don't know why you may Get your reader to believe that this is a culprit because they're lying to the cop. But what going back to the why question, what is the why of the suspect? Well, he may not be the guilty party, but he may be trying to hide something else of I didn't commit the murder, but I don't want my wife to find out that I was with somebody that I wasn't supposed to be. So I'm lying to you right now because I know she's going to find out if I say anything. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where you can create those red herrings that are kind of uh, important to telling uh, mysteries, especially. Um, but understanding that the goal of an investigation is to plot every single thing they can onto a timeline, you really need to do that yourself as the author in order to paint that full picture. And then you can decide when, like, if you know that, you know, back in 1982, your suspect was driving an orange, you know, Ford Pinto, right? You know, you plotted that out. That may be something you can reveal as a clue early on in a cold case story and then have it revealed, you know, further on. So it's once you plot out that whole timeline, then you can start playing around with the story as far as what you're going to reveal and when. Mm. And I was just thinking then with the lies and, you know, you mentioned earlier about an interrogation room dialogue shouldn't be the cop telling every, everything that's happened, it should actually be a whole load of lies and subtext with pretty, right. yeah, pretty much the cops not saying, you know, this is what happened. Is that right? I tend not to, <laughs> yeah, I tend not to ask a question unless I already know the answer and I'm giving him a, ch a chance to either tell the truth, you know, where I'm assessing his truth telling nature or he's outright lying to me and I know I'm on the right path. Or, I, I mean, we can end up, um, getting kind of um, astray by focusing on the lie and not really thinking about why. Um, this kind of, uh, that earlier we talked about the tropes. There's one other trope mm. that drives me nuts. And that is when the detectives walk into a crime scene, they're looking at the body and whether or not they're actually in the crime scene or not, but they automatically have this answer as to what happened. And like there's somebody on scene who's like, oh, this happened and they did this and this, you know, where they pantomime all of the scene of what happened. This is the first 10 minutes you're in a crime scene. If if you commit to a story and a narrative in your head, the rest of the investigation is going to be tainted by a cognitive bias of mm -hmm. does this or a confirmation bias, I should say. So um, does this evidence support my working theory of how things work? And if it doesn't, then I'm going to discount it. Where in reality, we need that evidence to just uh, empirically stand for itself. And then we can make inferences from it later, not walk into this crime and just automatically assume we know everything, which TV cop shows love to do. And we want our character to be right, you know, um, and some of the best do it. I mean, one of my favorite movies was Heat, but you, Al Chino, who's a detective lieutenant, not a detective, again, the rank thing, is standing over a bunch of dead bodies at a crime scene and saying, these are who these guys are. And this is why, this is what all of this means. And it's just like, well, that's pretty cool for the viewer to see, but 
maybe we need to infer some of that and take a step back and not just assume we know everything. Well, then it just on movie. We're almost out of time, but um, is <laughs> is Seven a good cop movie? I love Seven. <laughs> Me I absolutely too. Love seven. Yeah, um, and I love David Fincher as a director. Um, yes, it is. Uh, I mean, I'd like to think I'm more of uh, Detective Somerset than uh, you know, or uh, Morgan Freeman's character yeah. than Brad Pitt's character. But um, no, it it that was a a fantastic movie, and and in fact, I saw it a week like walked into the theater not knowing anything about it a week after I'd seen Usual Suspects. So mm -hmm. I just had like this mind blown experience of, you know, finding out the ending. So yeah, it doubled down. But yeah, I love that movie. And then um, the other ones, just if you're going to do your own kind of research, The Wire on HBO was one of my favorites and one of the most realistic cop shows. And then currently right now, Bosch on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, and more importantly, Michael Connolly's books. So if you go back, like a lot of times the writers really want to have believable scenes and dialogue and not feel like it's a bunch of exposition. Read the last two or three books of Michael Connolly's. Read them the first time for the journey and enjoy it, But then second time you go through, start dissecting it as an author. Start looking at the scenes that he includes, and it seems so seamless. Like two characters are riding in the car. They're going from a crime scene to a crime lab. Does he need that scene? Well, the reason the scene's there is because the conversation is moving that story forward. And if it didn't do that, you didn't need the scene. So he's a real master of that craft. So I, I like, if you want a master class in telling a detective story, he's definitely the best at it. Ah, oh, good to know. And of course, he is the show, I think he's the showrunner, or he's very involved with the actual TV series, yes. right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's yeah. one of the benefits of working for Amazon, I guess, on the studio side. Not to go under the whole uh, <laughs> other okay. conversation. Not a political show. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. um, but no, exactly. this is so fantastic. I could talk to you forever. But of course, there is your <laughs> your podcast is available. But also tell us about there might be a book coming, right? <laughs> Yes. So I've been working on a book for about the last year and a half. Um, and then hopefully by the time this podcast airs, it should be up for pre-sale. Uh, it's called The Writer's Detective Handbook. Um, and then another great resource that I want to mention real quick is um, Patrick J. O'Donnell's book called Cops and Writers. It will be out soon. He is a sergeant with a major metropolitan police department in the Midwest, but he's also hosting a police procedural panel panel at 20 Books Vegas. And so uh, he's asked me to be on it. And we've got um, Jennifer Servino, who's a defense attorney. We're going to have this whole panel of basically doing the same kind of discussion with the people that are attending 20 Books Vegas. So if you're listening and going to that, please be sure to show up. That would be awesome. That's November 2019. Yes. Right. So time sensitive, but uh, whenever yeah. people are listening, uh, the writer's, oh, yeah, writer's detective handbook um, will be out. So where can people find your website and your podcast? And you also have a fantastic newsletter as well. Tell us where we can find these things. So the podcast is called Writer's Detective Bureau. And the easiest way is to, for your listeners is to start on my website, just writersdetective.com forward slash podcast. That way they can hear a little trailer of the podcast to see if it's something they want to listen to. And it's also the way that they can send in a question for me to answer on the air. And if you get selected, then I also plug your author page or um, website or whatever you want. So fantastic. Well, it. that was brilliant, Adam. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me. It's been fun.